Malcolm Turnbull, many of you will know, was a pretty early entrant into the social media space on uh, Facebook, QuickSmart, and one of the first, if not the first, I'm not sure, the first politician perhaps to start Twittering. So can I first say welcome, welcome Thank to you. Media 140. Thanks. Great to be here. Why did you start tweeting? Well, it, it, I'm, I've, I've been involved in um, digital communications for a very long time, uh, going right back to when we started Aussie Mail. Um, 15 years ago, uh, and I have a, fa a fascination for and passion for uh, the whole digital world. So as every new, you know, medium, new idea comes up, uh, I always try it. And just at this point, I just, um, just remind you, Malcolm will be taking questions afterwards. We're just going to have a 10 or 15 minute chat here. Then it's over to you in the audience, in the auditorium and online. So save up your questions. Um, I think we'd better clear this up before it goes any further because I know a lot gets said about this. Do you do all your tweeting yourself? I have, a, I have an assistant Twitterer in uh, one of my uh, staff. Tommy Tudor, hope, helps with uh, a lot of it. But I do a fair bit myself. But How do you... Well, how do you decide? Do you do you just you know Twitter on what you're doing, how you're feeling, what it is you, what movie you've seen, or do you use it as a, a policy tool to get a well, message out? Well, I think we, you know, I don't, um, you know, I don't sort of. Uh, some people put the most remarkable things on their Facebook uh, pages or uh, on Twitter. Um, so it's no, it's it's a it's a, you know it's it's essentially uh, why use it as a tool of political communication. You and know, in I that case, do you? You know, have... I don't. I don't. As some people, do, you know, I don't say. You know, I have a blister on my right heel today, and it's. Uh, no, but do you say I, I just saw a I've great movie? I've lost the band aid. You know, pardon? Do you say I just saw a great movie, or? Uh, not, not off. No, not really. No, sometimes, but not. That's. It's a. It's more. Uh, it is more talking about. You know, the political issues. So, if it's a tool of political communication, do you believe, or have you made efforts to have any kind of sense of who you're dealing with in this space? What in terms of knowing who the people are? Yeah, the demographic. Well, I, I was tweeting the... with uh, where's the the uh, the Sparky with the, uh, the 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 apple in the front row? There he is. Good. Oh. <laughs> we were tweeting just on the way in here. Whoops. So that's a, there's a real. So you know person. him. <laughs> there he is. He's come out of he's, you know handsome fellow. You see, you'd think he was you know this sort of gigantic overweight person locked in a garage, living on <laughs> pizza and coke, and he looks quite athletic. You know. <laughs> You know, so he doesn't have, a, doesn't have a baseball cap with a propeller on it. I mean, you know, you're, you're creating a whole new image for uh, the online community there. He'll stand up later, folks. <laughs> yeah. um, what about your relationship... <laughs> there he is. <laughs> what about your relationship with journalists within the press gallery and outside of the press gallery? Has that... Uh, are they engaged much in this space with you? Not a lot. I've, I've only had a couple of... I had a... Uh, one of the journals on The Age sent me a tweet once, uh, Josh Gordon, I think. But normally those... I, I mean, I communicate with journalists all the time. Mm. It's a part of you know, my work. Uh, and norm, it, well, normally we just use you know, the regular email. Would you welcome more of that kind of interaction or do you think that would be confusing, confuse the role of mm. you know, journalist as journalist and becoming journalist as constituent or...? Uh, I, I think everyone, everyone's a constituent, you know, I mean, the, if you're a member of parliament, everyone who lives in your electorate is a constituent, even if they're journalists. Journalists do have, uh, <laughs> rights, journalists you know. do have rights, you know, <laughs> uh, and of course, if you're the leader of the opposition, uh, you're trying to persuade the whole national constituency to elect you and your party into government. So. Well, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that it hasn't become a sort of a, a, a sneaky way for journalists to get you directly, say, during something like a few weeks ago when there was talk about your leadership being, you know, you being on the way out. It didn't... There wasn't a lot of traffic Only around that. Only a few weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> the, um... I was being kind, Malcolm. <laughs> That's very kind. It's right. You're, you're, you're obviously uh, sort of softening up as the day progresses <laughs> after the... The, uh, tough, the tough nut of the early morning. Uh, only at breakfast. Mellow. Um, look, I, I think the, uh, you know, look, you've got to recognise that to some extent uh, politicians are like uh, the quarry and the journalists are like the hunters. And so, you know, there is an adversarial relationship. Let's be, let's be quite uh, clear about that. So uh, politicians who... Um, 
who you know carelessly um, uh, respond to journalists' inquiries on Twitter, you know, and are in effect conducting an online press conference, would need to know what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so you can do that, but but again, it, it, it's you know there are many ways you can do that. You probably be better off. To do something like that, you'd be better off uh, pre-advertising it so that lots of people are aware and can, uh, can get um, logged on. When John Howard became Prime Minister, he turned to Talkback Radio with great gusto to get his message out and was quite open about the fact that he wanted to go over and around the press gallery. He didn't want to be filtered through the press gallery. He wanted mm -hmm. to speak directly to, to the audience, to the voters. Is Twitter the next generation of that? Is that why you like it? Yeah, I, I think it's part of that, but I, you know, I don't. Get, can, can I just say to everybody, we shouldn't get too hung up on the medium. You know, it's the message that matters. I'm getting and, to the and, message. And the mediums will, uh, the, the mediums are only limited by our technological imagination and, you know, what you can do with it. And so, you know, there will be other applications and ideas that will, you know, perhaps super, supersede or or complement Twitter and Facebook and every other. Uh, conceivable application and technique that we haven't thought of. The critical thing, though, is the message. What? Let, let, let me actually give you a view. Of, you know, yes, please. I'll just go. give you a bit of a view. Someone that's been involved in the media for a very long time, you know, either as a practitioner or as a victim. Um, the <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes both. Uh, the um, the way I see it, when I started off as a journalist. Uh, working for the Nation Review, uh, you know, more than well over 30 years ago, the people, you know, uh, readers, viewers, could see content, journalistic content, news content through a limited number of windows. You know, there were a number of television windows. There was the ABC and three commercials, and you know, then the SBS, uh, and then there were some print windows, some big newspapers, and the barriers to entry. Uh, and competition were gigantic. Now, in the case of broadcast media, they were legal. They were statutory barriers. Obviously, in the case of the newspapers, they were more economic barriers, but they were real nonetheless. And what's happened is that that um, range of windows has just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point now where really anyone can be a broadcaster. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get an audience, uh, you know, a top-rating audience, but you can be, you know, sitting at home and you can be streaming a video onto the web, you can be blogging away and potentially you have the whole world available to, to pay attention to what you're saying. And that is dramatic, that has totally changed the nature of media. The gatekeepers have been bypassed. You know, it's like somebody, you know, imagine if somebody, you know, with the toll booth on the road and then everyone just starts driving around it and driving around it and driving around it. You're standing there at the toll booth and nobody's stopping. So you're seeing uh, an extraordinary change in the media. And, and the interesting thing, we were just talking earlier about this, is how are businesses, media businesses going to make a living going forward? You know, this is a real issue. Uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, famously said back in the 90s, late 90s, and it was a very profound comment, he said, the internet will destroy more profitable businesses than it will create. The internet will destroy more profitable businesses than it will create. And you can see that. Look what's happening to newspapers. Look what's happening to free-to-air television. You know, these businesses that were regarded as just licenses to make money because they were the, the windows, you know, and it was very hard to compete with them, no longer have that monopoly. So sure, that's, think... that's a revolution in... Uh, in in media, and it, and it moves power and leverage away from the person that had owned the medium, which is the point I was making about we shouldn't concentrate on the medium so much. The medium or the window is not so important. It is the content or the message. And that's what you, you're using it for Correct. as a political tool. So what message then in 140 characters are you putting out at the moment, say, on asylum seekers? And what feedback are you getting? Is that an active exchange you're getting back at the moment well, from the this Twittering audience. See, again, again, if you're a politician, or if, you know, frankly, if you're in any line of work where consistency and conviction are important, and certainly it's vital in politics, your message has got to be consistent. You can't say one thing on Twitter and another thing on Facebook 
and another thing on the ABC News and another thing in the Sydney Morning Herald. You, so your message, you know, you ask about asylum seekers, the message is a pretty straightforward forward one. Kevin Rudd recklessly unpicked a border protection policy that worked and now he has a colossal catastrophic policy failure on his hands. So you're getting a lot of tweets back on that? Well, we get, you get a lot of, a lot of tweets, both, uh, you know, critical and, uh, su you know, supportive. You get a range of views, but it is a, it is a, the message has to be consistent because, because the person that is twittering is also heard me being interviewed by you, felt sorry because you've been so <laughs> cruel to me, uh, seen me, you know, on the, on Kerry O'Brien uh, with Laurie Oates felt or even sorry with I... Alan Jones, you know, and, uh, and maybe read an op-ed that I've, I've written. So, so all of everything is, it's a continuum. We'll open up to questions in just a minute, but I'm just wondering if you're finding that the the engagement you're getting, the responses you're getting uh, in the Twitter sphere, the Twitterverse, um, is is more frank, is more um, no, I bullshit, don't, to I, be frank. I don't. Well, I think sometimes it's a bit cheekier, uh, but but you know, I um, as I say, I get hundreds and hun hundreds, many hundreds of emails. Uh, well. A, a week, and you know, sometimes, sometimes if there are campaigns on, we can get thousands in a week. Uh, the you get some pretty frank exchanges electronically. Um, I um, the people are actually because Twitter is a broadcast. People are a little bit more constrained than they are in an email. I, I, I've had some hilarious email exchanges from people, which, which often begin the email sent at about one a.m. <laughs> And it says, I won't repeat what it says, but it's, it's full of expletives, you know, and it generally accuses me of, uh, you know, being the vilest, most ghastly person that can imagine. And I will generally write back and say, thanks, I hope that made you feel better. <laughs> and the next email comes back and says, oh, my God, I'm so sorry, I've been out all night <laughs> drinking. You're actually not that bad. And, uh, and I go back and I say, listen, there's no reason to feel bad about it. I'm just glad you got it off your chest. You know, can I come and see you? <laughs> One guy actually came and helped on the campaign uh, last time. And he's, when, you look at the, when you look at the original communication, it was just... But it was like, I think sometimes, you know, people use the internet in the same way as, uh, as a way to express rage, you know, and they, because they feel they're more anonymous. So it's like, you know, people who stand under a railway... Uh, bridge, you know, when the train's going over and swear at the top of them, scream at the top of their voice because no one can hear them. Well, it's time for yeah. you guys to have a scream yeah. now. Are you happy to take some questions? Yes, yeah, sure. sure. Uh, again, put up your hands, wave wildly, and just make sure we can see. We've got first question here. And please identify yourself and keep the questions relatively tight. Uh, my name is Lauren Fitzgerald. I'm from a student at the University of Wollongong. Um, as a former journalist, as you say, some would think that that would be an advantage, um, becoming a politician, understanding the way that the media works. But with the way that the media is evolving so rapidly internally, do you find that that former experience is more of a hindrance or are you able to keep up with the way the media works internally? Yeah, I, I, I think it, I can keep up with it. I think it's, um, you know, the again, it, it, the message is the key, not the medium. So... Uh, don't, it doesn't, um, you know, the fact that a view, an, an opinion or a thought is carried over the internet as opposed to, you know, being printed on, on paper, uh, it's, the, the, medium, the, the medium has much less influence on the message than people imagine. The thing to focus on, my line of work, is to use every medium, obviously, to reach as many people as possible, and in particular to engage with them, uh, I mean, I, I, I'll give you an example of, um, of, uh, of the things that, you know, the serendipitous things that can happen, which can only happen if you take communication and you take the people that write to you seriously. I remember some years ago when I was, when I was uh, I'd just been appointed parliamentary secretary to John Howard and I was responsible for national, for water policy. And I was, and ultimately that, you know, resulted in the federal government taking over all the interstate water, which was a huge revolutionary reform, so a very worthwhile reform on any view. 
Um, but at the beginning of my time there, I got an email from a guy who I had no idea who he was, and it was just a, some thoughtful things about water. I wrote back to him. He came back. And I wrote back to him again, and I said, this all happened in a few days. I said, you know, you obviously know a bit about this area. It's very interesting, some of your insights. And he said, well, actually, I have the XYZ chair in water at such and such a university, and I've just finished this new book. Would you like it? And he, I said, of course. And so I then got a PDF of the latest, you know, the tome, the book on water in Australia that had not yet been published. And it all came about, uh, and got it months and months before it was officially published, all came about just because of that little interaction. You know, now, nowadays that could have been done on Twitter. You know, so that was, it's the, it, but it, it, it's not so much the medium, it's the reaction, the engagement that makes the difference. Okay, we'll take another one from here and I'll go check the Twitter screen. Uh, Adam Joseph, Herald Sun. Could I ask, do you follow Kevin Rudd on Twitter? Does he follow you back? And have you had <laughs> no. any lively exchanges by direct messages? No. Come on. No, I, um, I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't follow uh, the Prime Minister on Twitter, and I'm sure he doesn't follow me. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the floor up here. Hello, Jacinta Isaacs, consultant. Um, I'm just wondering if you did attach the same... Can you same just wave? I can't yes, see where you are. It's oh, hard there to see Good. people okay, from sorry. here. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you'd attach the same degree of importance. You mentioned the, the importance of the message over the medium. Would you attach the same degree of importance to um, tweets coming from, from your constituents as opposed to emails? You mentioned you had you know, hun hundreds of emails you respond to every week, yeah. but perhaps less so to the tweets. Yeah, I think the, the, um, the, that, that's, a, that's a really good question and, and it's a sort of perhaps a qualification to, to what I was saying earlier. The, it, there is, the, the advantage of emails is that you have a much easier record of them. You know, you've got them, they're in a file, they're readily sorted, they can be searched. It's a lot easier to manage uh, in terms of correspondence. So I would say to, you know, to anyone who's, uh, to everyone who's watching or listening to this, if you want to, you know, if you want to send me something, particularly, if, obviously, if it's more than 140 characters, uh, email is, you know, the old, uh, it, it, you know, it's an oldie but a goodie, and it is, as I say, still the killer app of the internet. Now, this is the Aussie mail founder talking, or is this, you well, know, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, are you saying the Twitter revolution is not quite the revolution? No, 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 it's, look, it's undoubtedly a revolution, but, uh, you know, it is, it is a short messaging service, and so it's, uh, it's for alerts, it's for references, it's for very short messages, uh, but, and, and of course it's a broadcast medium, and of course a lot of people want to, um, they're particularly you know, concerned at getting a direct communication. So I think what you're signalling is you're tending not to use Twitter in a one-on-one -on -one exchange that goes on backwards and forwards. Correct. Yeah, okay. I prefer to use email for that. Yeah. Okay. On this down here. Yeah, hi. Simon Thompson, freelance journalist. Um, you were saying that your focus, I suppose, is very professional in that you focus on coalition policy and what you say. Voters often react to the human being behind the policies, and I'm wondering and interested in why you don't be a little bit more Malcolm, the husband, the human being, yeah. in doing that rather than sort of leaving that to Women's Weekly or Annabelle Crabb in the <laughs> quarterly essay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, I guess there's a... You try to, in the political life, you try to preserve a private realm. So that's a, that is a part of it. And... Um, and I think that's, you know, that's probably a big part of it. And I also, you know, I, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not a devotee of the running an, an, a constant, continuous commentary on yourself. You know, it's one thing to, to put in a tweet, you know, as I did today, you know, I'm coming here to this conference or might be, you know, I'm going to give a speech in Melbourne tomorrow and, you know, might provide a reference to that. But uh, as some people do, you know, to be just, in effect, completely self-absorbed, saying, you know, I got up this morning, I've got a headache, or, you know, I had Wheaties for breakfast, or uh, it's a drag, it's raining because I, you know, wanted to play cricket, or, you know, whatever. Uh, that's, that, that's a, that is, I guess, a little, a little too self-absorbed uh, 
uh, for me. But uh, you know, no, no doubt some people would find it amusing. I suspect most people would find it incredibly dull. It's an interesting thing, though. The social, the social media is, I think, thrives on breaking down the, the private realm. So perhaps you're not going to be engaged there as successfully or as, um, with as much impact if you're determined to maintain the, the private realm. Well, I don't think politicians have much privacy, Fran. Uh, and, um, you know, the, you, you have very little privacy. So um, it's... Um, and, and so I, th- I think it's a... You know, I think it's... Look, it's, not, it is a, it's a challenge. It's a good question. You know, how mm. do you manage that private realm? And it is, uh, you know, you can walk out as uh, Lucy and I did the other day, walk out of our front door at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning for an early, you know, for a walk with our dogs, um, you know, me looking as scruffy and unshaven relaxed. as you normally would at seven o'clock in the morning, completely relaxed, and bang, there's a news photographer there with a, who starts snapping. Now that's, you just have to smile and get on with it, but I think there is a, you know, there's a degree of, of private life that... Um, everyone seeks to preserve. And I, I mean, you know, I, I just... Um, President Obama was talking about something else when he gave... You know, remember the young guy said, you know, what advice can you give me about becoming president, I think? And one mm-hmm. of the things Obama said was, you know, be very careful about what you put on Facebook. A lot of people put very personal things and pictures and so forth. Uh, I think it's important to maintain... For everybody to maintain some privacy, and I think uh, it's obviously important for politicians too. Hi, um, Ellen O'Connor, political historian and interested person. Mm. Um, Getting back to your comment before about the medium not being so important, it's more the message, you kind of said that a number of times. I would say, particularly in politics, that um, there is a great difference between the different mediums you're putting your... um, message across in as to what you can actually express. Do you think in this new social media environment that, one, there is a danger of making policy on the go, so to speak, to stay ahead of the pack and to kind of create that sensation so that people are going to be discussing you? Is there a danger of that? And two, what do you think has happened to the traditional um, process of the well-made political speech, good political rhetoric and a well-thought-out statement in this new social media environment? I think that they're they're good points. Well, policy on the run's is never a good idea. And where politicians often get caught into that is more often in radio interviews, uh, where particularly where the host is very, you know, strong personality and starts to bully them a bit, and uh, they'll find, you know, they find themselves uh, <laughs> agreeing. Fran's, Fran's uh, not at all like this. But so it's very important to... That, that, that's just a, a question of discipline. You've just got to be very careful about that and recognise that there is a bit of a gotcha um, culture in the media uh, that the Labor Party are, are practitioners of this in a huge way, but the media do it too, where a one remark is taken massively out of context. I mean, I don't know how, how often, I, but be hundreds of times in question time, Kevin Rudd or Wayne Swan stand up gleefully with a bit of transcript and they will quote, you know, half a sentence from my or one of my colleagues' interview, which is, you know, putting it completely out of context and saying, aha, you know, we've got you, you've made some slip-up. That's, so discipline's important. Um, in terms of a well-made speech, I, I, I think there is a great deal to be said, for, still to be said for the well-crafted speech. Uh, it's always an interesting balance between whether you read a speech or whether you deliver it extempore. Uh, I, I have that debate all the time. I very often will write a speech and then not read it or just speak to it. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I'll, I'll read a speech, sometimes I'll, I'll stand up without any notes at all and, and uh, you know, deliver something that is probably as good as I could have, uh, a good a, a speech as I could have uh, read. The, the challenge in, in speech-making between reading a speech and delivering it extempore, I might say, is not simply the question of spontaneity, which is very important, but it's the issue of eye contact. It's why, you know, I've always felt that people overdo PowerPoint presentations. Uh, Kevin Rudd's a great devotee of PowerPoint presentations, but, 
The, As was the, Peter Costello. The, the problem, yeah, indeed. The, the problem with um, you should really only use those visual tools uh, to illustrate something that you can't adequately describe. Now, university lecturers, of course, you know, put up their notes so it's easier for the students to write them down. But for a, a speaker who's speaking, trying to get a message through to an audience, maintaining that eye contact is very important. So whether you lose it because you've got your head down reading the text of your speech or the audience loses it because they're looking over your shoulder at the PowerPoint, uh, either way, you've lost that eye contact. And we've only got Malcolm for another 10 minutes, and I know there's lots of questions. I'm just going to take one from here. Then there's a speaker there. There's someone here with that. Oh, she's got a microphone now. So I'm coming back to you. But uh, Malcolm, Upstart Magazine wants to know, would the outcome of the Republic referendum have been different if Twitter and Facebook were up and running, do you think? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think, the, um, I think the, you know, there are fundamental uh, challenges of changing the Constitution. It's formidably difficult to change the Australian Constitution. There's, you know, we've had 46 referendum questions and only eight have been passed, and it is, it's, it's um, more than 60 years since a referendum was, question was approved, which was at, at all controversial, and that's going back to 1946. So essentially, to get a referendum question passed, it's got to be, have overwhelming support, overwhelming support, and some would say very little opposition. Um, I was just wondering, what do you think of the detriments of being such an avid user of social media, that being Twitter, Facebook, um, anything kind of like that? What do you think is kind of detrimental to your cause as an aspiring Prime Minister, I guess? I, I don't think there's anything detrimental about it. I think it's all, it, it's just all part of this, you know, rich continuum of, of communication. I, you, know, I, you know, as I was saying when I was um, sort of trying to put a bit of, you know, con conceptual theory, I suppose, behind the way I see it, um, at the core, there is the content, the, in my case, the political message. I try to get that message across in a consistent way a whole range of media and platforms. And that goes from writing a letter to my constituent who's sent me a letter in the post, to Twitter, to Facebook, to talking on the radio with Fran, to writing an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, you know, the whole kit and caboodle, the whole thing, and it's all one continuum. So as a new medium comes up, I want to take advantage of it because I'm in the communication business. My business is to show to Australians the values I have, the policies I have, my party has, the criticisms that we make of the government and why we present a better alternative to govern Australia at the next election. That's my mission. I think we may only have time for one more. Let's have a go. Yeah, um, you have Joe Hockey uh, talking in Parliament um, on right. Twitter. Would yeah. you like to see more parliamentarians twittering while they're sitting in Parliament? Should, like, should they Wilson twitter? Tucky, I'm a little bit, I have to say I'm a bit ambivalent about that. Um, I think the, it, it's fine for Annabelle Crabb to be sitting up in the press gallery, you know, twittering away at uh, incredible pace. But for a... Uh, certainly, you know... From my point of view, I, I think uh, if I was sitting there twittering right through, you know, being a commentator on something in which I'm actually a participant. So I, I'm a little bit ambivalent, but uh, I won't cast judgment on others. But, you know, obviously, as the leader of the opposition, uh, I'm there, if you like, head to head with the prime minister. It's important for me to be uh, very much focused on what's happening there at the time. I do use my BlackBerry in the House but mostly for the purpose of getting information. You know, can you, might send an email to one of my staff, you know, can you, you know, bring in such and such a report or can you look up this or can you check something and then they'll send something to me. So it is very, very useful. But sitting there, you know, writing an Annabelle Crab type commentary, I don't think that would be a good look. So frankly. have you instructed Joe Hockey and others not to? No, I... I he, look, this is, you know, the, 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 in these sort of, quote, new media areas, and I'm, I'm a bit sceptical about the term new media, but we're only limited by our technological imagination. I think people will try things and, you know, they'll work, they won't work. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like a, you know, an, an old man, but uh, 
the, there are so many absolute killer applications that everybody was signed up to that just died. You know, I mean, so there are so many things that seem to be the new, new thing that turn out not to be. And I mean, remember Pointcast. Most of you are too young to remember it. You know, Colossal. No. Vanished. There you go. <laughs> that was a big deal once, Fran. Uh, it was worth a lot of money at one point. I remember the walled gardens, you know, and uh, portals and uh, all of these. The, the, the one, if you want a guiding, you know, a bit of a general guiding star for, for what's going to work on the internet, people want, this is why I'm a liberal, of course, I'll wrap up on this, People want freedom. They want choice. So any application that gives people more freedom and more choice and more ability to express themselves is going to be uh, successful. And, of course, that is why the whole digital world is such a challenge to the established media businesses because they are, you know, getting back to my earlier example, they are the gatekeepers, the, the toll gatekeepers, who found that people can do what they want to do and read what they want to read without having to pay the toll anymore. And just uh, before we let you go, it was very interesting to ask Mark Scott this. I wonder if you know how many people are following you? I think on Twitter it's about 17,000. And uh, on Facebook we've moved to a... Uh, it's, it's a sort of more... It's like a... I think they're called a fan page, but it's because it's... Which is a bit silly, I guess, but because... Uh, we went over the limit of friends, oh, so so get that because you can only have five thousand. <laughs> yeah, well, you can only have, as you know, you can only have five, and it, it gets anyway. With that's so that's about that in terms of uh, so Facebook's around five thousand thereabouts, and uh, on um, in terms of our mail, our email list, as I say, our list's about fifty thousand. So and and you know, growing all the time. So okay, Malcolm Turnbull, thank you very much. Could you thank, thank the you. opposition leader, Malcolm yes. Turnbull?